Uh, good morning again. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I would like to thank NASDAQ for the invitation again. And also to thank our colleague from PPT, PPT Chem to be here this morning. Uh, I think it's a good opportunity for us to present today some of the work that we are doing for the last years on the topic of algae and biofuel. I very glad to tell you that we have finally been able to sign a research project with PPT. It took a while, but finally it is working. We are very proud. We think that this project is, will be the first uh, collaboration between our group, Ben Gurion University, and PPT, another uh, company in Thailand. We are also very proud that our group and some other in the university has a long-standing collaboration with university in Thailand, with students. Our group has delivered a few courses during the last year in Thailand. So we are welcoming uh, in our institute in Berlin University students and scholarship that we can provide. We have a school of desert studies in our uh, institute, which can uh, actually provide as I said, scholarship, lodging for good students. And we are welcoming any collaboration between young scientists, mature scientists, and everybody which are interested in our research is most welcome. You can find all this, all this information in the website of BGU, and I put also the website of the Institute. So as I said, I am serving as the head of the French Institute of Agriculture and Biotechnology. I'll uh, give you just a brief introduction to what, what the Institute... Don't show me what it is. What the Institute is doing. And uh, so you see, I mean, we, as you said in the introduction, Israel, 60% of Israel is a desert and we don't have water. The major problem of Israel is, is really water, and I don't think energy. So the mission of the Institute is really pointed out here one sentence, to investigate that innovation means using marginal source of water to sustain agricultural production in dry land for human beings. This is more or less what you see when you come to, to our campus. This is the scenery. There were some German scientists which came to visit us, and they said, who, who designed this? Uh, architecture. We say, well, this is God, you know, you know him? <laughs> okay, so there are a few topics that uh, the, the Institute is researching. One is plant biotech, the second one is uh, water management, and the third one is uh, aqua biotech. In the plant biotech, we have a very strong group who is doing actually uh, stress physiology and molecular genetics. The concept of the group actually is different from others. And we are trying to understand how plant can live in the desert, how it can cope from different stresses. So there are a lot of work that people are trying to, to research as a plant uh, resistant to salt or plant resistant to heat. The concept that we are talking is different. The plant in, in, in a desert is uh, exposed to different stresses. So the strategy is to understand how this plant can cope with different stresses. And we do molecular genetics. We have a lot of uh, work on physiological studies, on, on breeding, on and ecophysiology. And you'll have uh, today a representative of this group, uh, Dr. Shimon uh, Lachmilevich, who is going to take you some about that. We have a very strong work also on water management, mainly on, on, on half of harvesting and irrigation. And again, there is another colleague from us, uh, Dr. Naftali Lazarovich, who will tell you about irrigation. And the third uh, topic is uh, aqua biotech, in which we are growing algae and fish in the desert. And people say, well, we are crazy. You know, you grow fish in the desert and algae in the desert. We told them actually fish and, and algae are, are suitable to grow in the desert because we have, for the algae, we have a lot of sunshine. We have brackish water. We have seawater. So actually, to grow algae in the desert is something very logic. So we have a lot of activity in these things. We have also a lot of activities in, in uh, uh, growing uh, ornamental fish in the desert. Again, very strong activity, and, and I'll talk a little bit about the algae today. 
And of course, we have other activities of livestock grazing. The idea is that how we can uh, grow fish or some cows in the poor land that we have. So the, this is the topic of, of the uh, institute. And as I said, you have the website. OK, so the topic of today of my lecture is really algae as feedstock for biofuels. And really, I, I want to tell you from the beginning that um, I, am, I was not so optimistic and I'm still not optimistic regarding this topic. And uh, slowly, slowly today, you, you, you are start to realizing that all the big company who is doing, uh, who started to, to work on biofuel for microalgae, slowly, slowly changed the orientation of their research. It's not anymore a feedstock for biofuel. It is a biorefinery concept. We are growing biochemical from algae, and the part will do also energy. Because people start to realize that to grow algae for $1 per kilo is almost impossible. So slowly, slowly, there are a shift on the concept of this big company. Well, I showed this slide a few times ago also. But I think today you cannot uh, look on feedstock for algae, for, for, for energy, if you don't realize that the whole global is facing different issues which are interrelated, all of them. So we cannot talk about feedstock if we cannot talk about energy. We cannot talk about energy if we don't talk about water. So there is a big uh, interrelation between these topics. And of course, this is my famous slide, which called that there is a conflict between these three topics between the water, the energy, and the food. And, and if you tell me today what is the biggest uh, problem the humanity is facing, I will tell you the food crisis. Because the energy will be solved. And part of the energy crisis is related to big, uh, big economic uh, issue, which is related to, to companies and, and, and politics, so on and so forth. But when it comes to hunger, and there is no food, this is creating war and problem. So I think that food for the, the future is going to be our main issue to regard. Energy also, but not too much. Remember that the biggest uh, problem which energy is causing is by big countries. USA, China, India. There are a lot of other comp countries which really energy is not their problem. Their problem is the food. So I think in the future you'll see more and more people working about uh, ability to create food for our uh, uh, global issues. So I, I brought some uh, examples that you know for, from uh, your work for sure that there are few plants which can be used for, uh, for energy, for, for oil, production of biodiesel. But I think even that you start to hear that there are a lot of uh, companies in India, in, in China, all over the world that uh, they are trying to grow a uh, jatropha, either or castor or palm oil. This is not going to be the solution for, for the energy crisis. This is going to be a small niche that will replace maybe 1 or 2 percent. The prediction that in 2050, only maybe 5 percent of the total consumption of energy will become from, uh, from green feedstock. So green feedstock are not the future to solve the problem of our energy crisis. It's, they are very good, but it will have they will solve a local uh, problem, not the huge issue. So, and for sure, all of this uh, work on plants, it's really, I believe, has uh, no long future. So I don't think the future I is there. And of course, Jatropha, everybody's talking about Jatropha, and there is a big company by the name of Sigenta that said after 20 years of research that actually we, we we don't have the technology, it's still uh, not available, and there is a lot of work to do in order to bring Jatropha to be a, a commercial viable stock. But again, it will be a margin of, of, of the problem. So today, if you tell me what is the direction that we should, we should go, one direction is to try to be more efficient, is to try to use all the leftover that we are producing for making uh, energy. And one of the uh, examples is, of course, what we call today grassoline. And this is second generation made from edible plants, the leftover. So today, companies which are producing ethanol from uh, corn, 
that start to produce also oil from the leftover. So the leftover of plant and, and every garbage that you're producing can be a very, very good source for, for biodiesel. So I think that the second generation of biofuel and mainly uh, all the, uh, the work which has been done on, enz on enzyme to get the, to the get it, uh, lot of material from, from wood could be a good solution to this issue. So actually, everybody said, well, we have problem of water, we have problem of food. So what, what will be exactly a good crop to be used for uh, bioenergy, for instance? And everybody will say, well, uh, algae is, of course, one example. Why? Because algae actually have a high growth rate. The doubling time of some algae can reach sometime even a few hours, so we're growing very fast. Of course, they do not require uh, agricultural land. They can be grown in the desert, for instance. We can grow them on seawater. Uh, we can use CO2. Today, you can see there are a lot of companies trying to, to promote their PR. They say, well, we build some algae. We take CO2 from the chimney, and we reduce the CO2 uh, global warming issue. Well, this is almost a small joke, because in order to reduce CO2 emission, you need to cover half of the planet with algae. And this is almost impossible. And also, the problem of commercial uh, 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 economics is also ridiculous, because CO2 is really the less uh, expensive part of all the process. So actually, more and more, the, the issue of CO2 is really more related to PR than really uh, uh, something of, of, of critical. So, of course, people like to see tables and so on and so forth. They say algae are very, very productive. Of course, algae are very productive. But after a long time of research, we, we today, I don't want to go along all of this uh, table here, just to give you a very, uh, a very strong number which says that the production of biomass on algae is about 24 grams per square meter per day, which is a high productivity relatively. And this is actually taken out from small scales. And this is the problem of microalgae. You see, this is today the, the biggest production of algae in the world. This is production of spirulina in California. And you see, wow, it's a huge production. Well, my friend, if you will put it on the right uh, scale, it is a very, very small steel. So when you're talking about production of algae, we are still very, very small compared to a corn production or rice production. Algae are still very, very uh, low in production side. So the, taking the number from there and extrapolation and say that algae are the future are really misleading. Well, again, this is another slide that maybe you know. Today, uh, we need to produce algae for half a dollar per kilo. We are here, very far from that. It is very, very quite difficult to bring the price down to this value here. And I brought this slide to tell you actually what's going on today in the world with microalgae. There are mainly three algae grown all over the world for a long time. One is, of course, the Dunaliella, which is grown in Israel and Australia. The other one is Chlorella, which is grown in, Thailand, in Taiwan and, and, and Japan. And, of course, Spirulina, that all you know, everybody grows Spirulina. But again, this is only three algae for the last 50 years and nothing new under the earth. Okay? So, more or less, this is the story of, of microalgae. Of course, there are other production sites. This is production of... Uh, a, a value product in Israel for uh, astaxanthin. I calling it a, a boutique production because this is you think it is big, but it's relatively small. But of course, the product there is ten thousand dollar per kilo. It's not half a dollar, so we can afford to grow algae in closed system and irrigation and so on and so forth. So if you have a product which has a high value, of course, we can go for that. So I, I told you a lot of things. So what the lab is doing on the research of, of algae for biofuel. So actually, I put uh, several activities that uh, are going in the lab. First of all, just giving you some uh, idea about the funding activity, what we're doing in improving productivity, to develop strains, molecular and uh, metabolic engineering, and what are the ways to minimize cost of production. So I'll go very fast. 
the, the group has been awarded recently few grants of few hundred thousand euro to, to work on this issue, several grants. And one of them, which we are very proud, is the one that we are collaborating is genetic engineering of algae. We believe that one way to improve productivity will be by genetic engineering. Although, you know, genetic engineering is not something which is accepted by the green uh, movement. But still, today, we think that the future of algae study is on engineering. There is another big project which actually starting this, uh, uh, this fall, this, this May. And this is a, a project funded by the EU to produce a 10 hectare of algae for biofuel. This is the first project that the EU is funding to, to, to tell uh, the community what it takes to make algae for biofuel. The economic is important, but it's not a valuable issue there. It's to show that we can do it from the beginning to the end. So this is the first project that the EU is funding. Our group is part of this project. There are other groups there, Italy, Spain, Portugal, which is involved. And uh, it will be, uh, the idea will be to build 10 hectares of uh, algae for biofuel. We have other projects which is related to, to, uh, to the production of algae, Sense Biosense. It's another project in which we're trying to develop sensors to monitor automatically all the parameters. So let's go a little bit more faster. Uh, the group, really our group is working on this biotechnology from different aspects, from basic study to molecular study and to biotechnology. And here I'm just giving you an example to monitoring. This is an algae which is full of lipids. And here the idea is to develop a method to measure online the lipids. And again, this is a, a, pub, a paper that we pu just published now. And you can see we can have monitor if we monitor the chlorophyll of the algae as a function of, of carotenoid, we can have a very good indication of the content of, of, the, of the lipids. So one way to do it very good is to monitor online the production of the lipids. I, I'm sorry about the, the color. I don't know what happened to the monitor. But anyhow, what you see here is a, a growth and a function of time. And by developing a new uh, medium, we can even increase double the production of, of the algae. So by improving basic things in the production, we can do things better. So the, the green line represents a new medium that we have developed in the group. And you can see here, it has even double production of the normal medium that people are using. Well, another thing that we are trying to, to understand, if, if in any time algae for biofuel will be worked out, it will be only for say, salt water. We don't have enough water to grow algae for biofuel if we think about uh, uh, water for agriculture. So the only way to grow is algae is in, in brackish water or seawater. And again, we're developing here. I don't want to go detail. This is a recent publication of the group. But why I brought this slide, it is the first time that we can show that we can produce on the same time an algae, which can make a lot of lipids, and on the same time, a very high value product. EPA, eicosapentaenoic acid. So this is the first demonstration that we can have. Because you know, when you grow a algae, they are not making secondary metabolites. They will do secondary metabolites when you stress them. And when you stress them, they stop growing. So you have a dilemma here. You want the algae to grow fast, but you want the algae also to accumulate uh, the, the, the storage product, or lipids. So when you start to accumulate the lipids, they will start to grow because you start to nitrogen. Here, we have developed a system in which we can grow the algae fast and at the same time produce also the lipids, uh, the, uh, the PUFA. I want to remind you a uh, basic things, that the lipids are a, a reserve material which are in globules in the cell. The, the PUFA are lipids which are related to membrane. So we can easily take the, lip, the oil from the algae and the remaining are rich with EPA. So this is a strategy that we think we can develop. And this is today uh, one of our new uh, things. Another thing that the group is doing, and we have about six or eight students, PhD students, working on metabolic engineering. And here, it seems very complicated, but I'll make it uh, very uh, simple for you. There are two products today that algae are producing when they are stored. One is lipids, and the other one is carbohydrate. So when you starve an algae to nitrogen, for instance, the carbon will start to flow either to, to make lipids or to make carbohydrate. We would like to understand the, the flow 
of this uh, issue. Why the algae, some algae are making a lot of carbon, of, of uh, carbohydrate, and the other one are making a lot of lipids. So there are a few PH students working on this issue in the group in order to see if we can control the flow of carbon. And of course, we are very strong also on lipid metabolism, and actually, what we are doing today, we try to understand what are the key enzymes in the lipid metabolisms which can control the system. And again, I pointed here a few enzymes. It's not so clear, but we are working on key enzymes which are actually exporting the, the fatty acid into the, the cytoplasm and deposit the fatty acid in, in triglycerols. So today, I believe we are the only group which is focusing on two very important microalgae, and these two microalgae are very unique. One is an algae which is called Pietochloris in Sisa. It's an algae that we have isolated from the mountain in Japan, and this algae is full of lipids, but in this lipid, it is, has concentrated a lot of PUFA, of archidonic acid. So this is the first example of an algae which makes lipids, but in this tag, it makes also a lot of archidonic acid. This is one. Because we believe if we want to increase the production of this comp value compound, we need to store them in the cell in different compartments. So this is uh, the, the first algae that we are working on. It's called Pietochloris. It's making about 45% uh, of, of, of lipids, and from that, 25% uh, archidonic acid. It is very a uh, unique organism. Uh, and he has a mechanism of, of PUFA sorting, is unknown, and we are trying to study this. this. So this is a one very important uh, algae in the group, and this is just, again, the, the lipids. This is how it looks like in, in a microscope. It's full of, of, of lipids. It is under fluorescent microscope. This is under starvation. The algae is really a barrel of oil. And more than that, in this oil, there are very high value product. There is archidonic acid or another acid that we are working on, DGLA. So it's a very unique system. How an algae can put this PUFAS, usually put on the membrane, in tag. So this is an important aspect. And we are doing a lot of work on genetic engineering. I don't want to spend time on that. The second algae that we are working is another model organism. It's a hematococcus. And this is my pizza slide. You can see oil in, in the green uh, uh, algae there, it's like really uh, like a pizza, pepperoni, something like that. And here, when you break the algae, this is the oil global. So again, the carotenoid, the astaxanthin in hematococcus is stored in oil global. Again, this is a very unique mechanism of storing a very high value product in, in tag. So again, we are doing a lot of work in this uh, issue. And of course, one of the work that we are doing now is trying to understand the global formation. Global, if the algae will make more global, maybe we can have more a way to accommodate this uh, high value product. And indeed, one of my research uh, students, which just finished now, and it is just a paper published now in lipids, in which we show that we have isolated the main, the, one of the main protein of the globals, and we believe that by overexpression of this protein, maybe in other algae, can make, uh, increase the, the protein, uh, the, the lipid uh, accumulation. This is a third, a third approach that the group is doing. We are taking, for instance, genes which make lipids from plants, and we try to put them in, in algae, and to see if we can express this, this gene into the algae to make more lipid. And here, this, this is just a very uh, a example that we took a, 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 a fungi which do not make lipids, we just put the gene which we isolated here. This, this is the, the, the mutant which ha cannot make lipids. By producing our gene inside this uh, mutant, it can make lipids. So just to show you what kind of work the lab is doing. Well, of course, this is research, basic research. We are doing also a lot of work to see what in the moment we can do. And this is a very nice slide that I would like to show, but I think this is the future, that actually we need to combine algae to other systems. We can combine algae with ethanol production or, or cattle production. Then we can have water coming from the cattle or, or, or nutrient, and we can have a CO2 coming from the plant. This is one example of what we call integrated system. I'll skip this one. This is another favorite of mine. This is one of the biggest uh, production of algae in the world. This is a lake in South Africa, which produced a lot of algae free. It is the blooming of algae. So the idea that we can harvest the algae here, 
And this is just how the lake looks like. This is by remote sensing. You see where the algae are concentrated by the wind. They are floating. We can harvest them. And of course, make uh, the, 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 the new thing that we did in this work was to show that indeed this microcystis, it's cyanobacteria, do not contain toxins. Because some of the strains which are blooming contain toxins, we just show that it is not containing the toxin. And of course, we can make from this, and uh, this is a project going on, we can harvest the algae and burn the biomass and have CO2 and, and, and so on and so forth. So this is an approach that the group is, is taking. So last but not least, the group is also developing high, high uh, uh, we think, a, a, a feasible bioreactor. And this is one which is very relatively cheap and, and good. This is how it looks like. This is on the less scale. And this is what we have developed as a concept. So. Let me summarize uh, my part by telling you that uh, uh, <laughs> algae biofuel need long-term RD more than R than D in all the area: algae culture, productivity, harvesting, and processing. CO2. The major problem will be actually everybody say we can use CO2 and we, we need water, we need land. All those three together are very, very difficult to bring all together. Uh, there are a lot of talks about uh, what kind of reactor are needed for biofuel. And today, the concept really is that the thing which will be needed is, is open raceways. But I think in the long run, algae will be never a source of biofuel for a, 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 a huge commodity. They will stay maybe as a niche to produce some kind of uh, oil, but in a small, in a small uh, uh, volume. But microalgae could become one component of future sustainable and society. So I want just to finish a part of my presentation by giving credit to the, to the people in the group. We are a few a senior researchers. We have technicians. And the group has between 10 to 15 students. Most of them are PhD students and postdocs. So I want to finish my talk by showing you a small movie. BioNet is the European network of national contact points in the bio and food areas. BioNet supports the participation of research centers, universities, and innovative SMEs in EU-funded FP7 knowledge-based bioeconomy research projects. Sense Biosyn, biosensors and sensors for the industrial biosynthesis process. GVAP. Genetic improvement of algae for value-added products. Both projects are funded by the European Framework Program. This is the our lab. partner in both projects is Professor Sami Bosiba, head of the Microalgal Biotechnology Laboratory of Ben Gurion University in Stable Care, Israel. The FE7 is giving us the possibility to be exposed to the top art of laboratory all over Europe for a special cause. For instance, in our project, we are collaborating with uh, almost 12 groups from seven European countries. In Germany, like Professor Sandman, or others in Italy, like Professor Tedici, which are leaders. Without this project, we will not be able to collaborate really to exchange students and to exchange know-how and to be able to work together to solve a problem which we, the, the project is, is facing. While microalgae are able to produce a wide range of products of interest, production costs are normally too high to compete with alternative production processes. Upscale and improvement of microalgae mass cultivation is improved drastically under improved control and supervision of growth parameters made possible by the use of different biosensors allowing the establishment and maintenance of optimal growth conditions a subject studied in Senso Biosyn project. The sensors developed allow online monitoring of the algae growth parameters and a more efficient production process, reducing production costs. Higher productivity can also be achieved by selecting or producing improved algal strains by means of mutagenesis or genetic engineering. 
This research is being supported by another grant to the GIAVAP Consortium, coordinated by Professor Sami Bosiba for the genetic improvement of microalgae for production of high-value products. Hagai Tsur is the CEO of Algitech, an Israeli company founded in 1999 and a world leader in the production and supply of natural astaxanthin produced from microalgae. Within one year, after the project will finish, we will have a sensor to do all this job automatically. Based in Kibbutz Katura, in the heart of Israel's Arava Desert, Algitech benefits from the best solar conditions for algae production. Why we are here in the Negev? Because we followed the research that came out from Ben Gurion University with Professor Sami Busiba as the head of this laboratory. For a scientist playing in the lab with few tubes and seeing this huge production site is like a dream come true. So I'm, I'm very proud and satisfied that at the lab research for the last years, the output of that is a huge industry, one of the biggest world production of algae in the world. The advantage that uh, Algatec can get from this kind of project is very huge. We will never achieve the results without the participation of so many partners all over Europe and Israel. The essence of, of, of the FP7 projects is really depend on the collaboration with SMEs. Without the SMEs, the project will be just as another scientific, pure academic activity. We are in a win-win situation. The academy is researching for us and we are working for them. Okay, thank you very much. This is really... <laughs> so I think I'm on time. Uh, so, any questions? Everything is clear, I'm sure. <laughs> Anybody who would like to have any questions to Professor Sami? So I think you made that very clear. Thank presentation. you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So next, I would like